CEO of Proof of Talent, the company he founded in 2019. Rob, thanks for joining. How are you today? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. So I love the company name and and someone who is a fan of the cryptocurrency space. It means a lot more to me than it does probably to those who are hearing it for the first time. So I want to understand how you, you started the company, but maybe you can explain what the name is and then tell in that story, talk about how you came to be here. Yeah. So as far as the name goes, proof of work is the consensus mechanism that kind of runs the Bitcoin you know, algorithm. And, and now there's proof of stake as well. And I wanted to start a recruiting company and I wanted it to mean something specific for the crypto industry, but I also didn't want it to sound so crypto specific that if you didn't know what proof of, if you didn't know what proof of work meant and you heard the name proof of talent, you might still be like, oh, okay, that 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 sounds normal, even if you didn't put two and two together. So uh, proof of work, proof of talent, we are a recruiting firm that you know sources talent and works with talent within the blockchain and crypto industry. So that's uh, <laughs> that was how the story came to be. It, it's, it's a great name. It's, it's pure brilliant. Um, I, I have to tell you, so I, I commend you for it. And I'll ask you to explain a little bit further for, for those, you know, so, you know, we, I think those of us who are familiar with uh, the blockchain and with cryptocurrency tend at times to take things for granted that, that others really know. But I, I, I don't know if you have a thought on this, but I think most people really um, are, are neophytes in the space and just learning. So if you wouldn't mind expounding a little bit and explaining the difference between uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain and how, how they work together, that, that would be very helpful. Yeah, sure. So for many, uh, for much of the industry, blockchain is the technology or uh, basically it's the technology that underpins the the industry as a whole. So Bitcoin has its own blockchain and then Bitcoin or BTC is also the asset that is traded. So a lot of times you'll see the price of Bitcoin reference or the same thing with Ethereum. Ethereum has ETH. That is the asset that has value, which is maybe $1,300 right now. There is also the Ethereum blockchain, which is kind of the the technology that underpins and, and drives that network. And there is some differentiation. You can have blockchain technology without the assets, uh, which some companies have built, like the IBMs of the world have, have been trying to build those with varying levels of success. But the public blockchains, such as Bitcoin, such as Ethereum, maybe such as Solana, um, that those are some of the more popular ones that you might see. And they have basically technology and then they have an asset tied to them as well. Perfect. I really appreciate that. It, there's such a learning curve that's necessary. Uh, and, and I've been following the space for about four years now, but I still feel like there's so much to learn. Um, when, when did you first get into to cryptocurrency? I got into cryptocurrency in December of 2013. I joke around that I bought the top of the one cycle, at least. So I, I got into crypto in December 2013. I saw an article about Dogecoin and it had launched maybe two weeks prior to that. And I kind of skipped over Bitcoin and I started to learn about Bitcoin, but I started mining Dogecoin and mining Bitcoin in December 2013, January 2014. And when I got interested in, in Bitcoin, Bitcoin was maybe $1,000 at the time, and then it collapsed 80% to $200 and essentially stayed there for two, two and a half years. And admittedly, I lost interest and the industry kind of did what it does. And it had a three, four year cycle and it came back in 2016, 2017. And I started getting interested again in it again. And when that happened, I told myself, I'm not going to waste another two, three years of not paying attention because I would have done a lot better off if I had paid attention to the industry sure. rather than than walking away so i've really been been in it in it since 2017 till you know up until now and i i don't plan on leaving so we'll see where that takes me i i see this a lot on on uh, bitcoin twitter where everyone has that moment where they were first introduced to it and mm -hmm. and they they disregarded it i remember my moment uh it, where a friend on the beach was telling me uh, about you know about this new technology, and I I needed to hurry and get into it. And of course, at the time, I I was pretty dismissive of the whole thing. And I looked back, and and that was about six years ago now. And and like everyone else, I add up you know how much uh, you know I, I, money I'd have if I if I'd uh, gone all in then. But um, easier said than done, right? And and it's yeah. still a very 
you know, volatile space. And I think with that, um, you know, it scares a lot of people off. I mean, what, what do you say to, to, to those people? Because, you know, I feel like it's one of those things where the more you know, the more comfortable you become with the volatility, but, but that's hard for an outsider. Yeah. The volatility is, is tough to stomach for a lot of people, especially those that have just gotten into the space. I mean, since the, we're in the midst of another one of those cycles now where Bitcoin and a lot of other cryptocurrencies that have been around for however long, Bitcoin topped out at around 65, close to $70,000 and is trading sub $20,000 again. Um, and that happened over the course of the past year. So, and a lot of other cryptocurrencies, quite frankly, right now are, are a lot worse. They're down 70, 80, 90%. So if this is the first time around for somebody, it can be, you know, it can be very difficult to, to, I guess, stomach that and to, to deal with it. Um, that said, I do think that the industry does tend to move in, in cycles and, and has traditionally shown that. And I think we're in the midst of another one. Granted, this time around, I think the entire economy and, and technology, especially the technology sector as, as a whole, has really seen similar performance, unfortunately. But that said, I, I kind of view a lot of, of cryptocurrency or a lot of the companies and, and projects within the crypto space, especially that have an asset attached to them, they're almost like startups that are trading on public markets 24-7, 365. And if you can think about some of these startups that have been around and, and eventually go public, it's like if they were trading on, on the New York Stock Exchange within the first year of their existence. And that has its pluses and that definitely has its minuses. And right now when things are down 70, 80%, certainly feels like a negative portion of that time. Um, but for me, I, I try and look at the the long term of of these things, and I see just an increasing digitization of the world. And I I think that there are a lot of points that that go to show there are some some issues with with how you know we do things as as a society. And I don't think crypto and and blockchain as a whole is is the you know the end all be all of this is going to make the world a hundred percent better. But I do think it's going to have a a place in that. So. That's a big portion of, of why I really wanted to, to kind of bet my career on this as, as a whole. Well, you're, you're not alone and you're not the only one betting big uh, in the space. And, and to me, that, that's where the comfort comes from is when you see <laughs> nation states you know, spending you know, a, a lot of energy and effort uh, on, on the future of cryptocurrency and companies with vast resources uh, you know, spending their dollars and, and their time and effort developing in that space. So I'm sure you knew that was going on uh, when you decided to, to really focus on that area. So let's talk about that for, for a minute. Um, you know, what, what do you see right now in terms of what kind of companies are hiring that space? Is it just the biggest companies? Is it SMBs as well? You know, who, who, who's looking for, for help in the blockchain space right now? Yeah, so at Proof of Talent, we say primarily focus on small to mid-sized startups is, is somewhat been our bread and butter. So this might be a little bit slanted towards that because there are also large companies that are hiring pretty significantly at, at this point in time. There are a number of, of banks and there are a number of large technology companies and consulting firms that are building out some type of blockchain practice or infrastructure or um, trying to kind of develop deeper support within this industry. That said, uh, we have tended to focus mostly on on venture backed startups that are typically developing some type of of blockchain infrastructure. Um, they also might be it could be more on the fun side, so they could be trading the asset. They could be investing in the space. It it really depends. But I'd say the average company that that we at Proof of Talent work with is usually between like five and 150 employees. And so that's where the bulk of, of my experience lies as far as the, the types of companies that are hiring. That said, it does extend you know, much beyond that in terms of larger companies, both larger players within the specific crypto space, but also there are a number of like the traditional players out there too that have looked at the growth within the industry and, and said, we want to be a part of that and we want to you know, supplement our, our growth with that. So I think both large and, and small companies hire for sure at this point in time, it's, it's really just a matter for the individuals looking it's, it's what their preference is in many cases. 
Nice. I, I like that. And and I suspect that a lot of those jobs are virtual in nature uh, that with the, the way the industry is heading, the way that the market's heading as a whole. Yeah, we work with quite a quite a number of, of remote focused roles. Most of the time, I would say it just has to be in the right time zone or close enough to the right time zone. Sometimes you know, somebody is, is, is in Asia and the majority of the, the company is in the U.S., that might be an issue for for somebody or, or vice versa. That said, most of the companies we work with are are remote or remote first. And there are some companies that are still headquartered in New York or San Francisco or, or Miami and maybe Austin. But um, most, I would say, are, are remote because it gives them the best access to talent, which I, I personally agree with. That said, if a company wants to have a headquarters, more power to them. Um, I think it makes your life more difficult, but you know. It's neither here nor there, I suppose. How have you? Uh, I I, I want to go on a couple of different uh, in a couple of different directions from what you just said. But what, how have you seen that change since COVID? I'm in Florida. Most yep. of our clients are in the southeast, um, and we've seen a big shift. But not not everyone is taking advantage of technology and the ability mm-hmm. to work remotely. What about your client base? Have you seen a change since COVID? I don't know if I would say there was. A mass well, there there was a massive change. That said, I think the crypto industry, I believe as a whole, was was one of the better equipped industries to deal with things when COVID hit. And and what I mean by that is, you know, Bitcoin was started in two thousand and nine. Uh, the vast majority of of large or medium sized crypto companies now, they weren't even founded until maybe 2015, 2016, 2017, even later. So these companies are brand new. They have all the latest infrastructure. They have all the latest technologies. Um, most of the time, their employees are are relatively young as well. And so with that said, I think th- these are companies that are kind of like born in the cloud and they're not very, they don't have a lot of tech debt. They don't have a lot of, inf- they don't have you know, office phones and, and desktop computers at the office or anything like that. So that said, I feel like it was very easy for a lot of these companies that were in the office to just say, all right, come in, get your laptop and go. And we're, we're moving. Like we're, you know, we already had Slack. We already had Zoom. It's not a big deal. And, and I think the biggest just conversation beyond that was whether, do we want to stay remote first or do we want to, to have, do we still want to try and bring people back into an office? And some companies did and some companies didn't. Coinbase, for example, like one of the largest companies in the space they had a headquarters in San Francisco, and I think they still do have a headquarters in San Francisco and a variety of offices, but they went fully, they went remote essentially. And it was, it was a choice that they made and some other companies did the same thing. And, and then some companies doubled down on, on the office. So that said, I do think it was a very easy transition for most companies in comparison to let's say a traditional finance if you're JP Morgan or whoever, and you have all this infrastructure in the office, I think that took a lot more time for these those people to move than than the crypto industry did. Yeah, and I think it, it makes it a um, more of a real estate decision as much as anything else. If you've made that big investment, we'll, we'll mm-hmm. see if Elon Musk ends up buying Twitter. It seems like the last the last I've read, it looks like he he, he may end up with it in the very <laughs> near future. And I know he's commented on the. Uh, the, the big headquarters that they have that, that I don't know what the price was they invested in, but it's massive and it's really hard to justify. Uh, we didn't go back to the office. A lot of our clients haven't gone back. I find it, it's gotta be fun in the startup space where you are, where you can actually weigh in on those things. Do, do you get a chance to to give that advice to, to companies looking to hire? We do. Generally, my advice is that if you want to have a, a, a headquarters, you want to have an office, great. But I do think that you get significantly better access to talent if you are open, at the very least, if you're open to remote talent, just because you know, there's there's a lot of debate about the like, the efficiency of remote employees and the ability to manage them and collaboration and all that type of stuff. And and that very may that may very well be true. That said, you are limiting yourself to employees within a 30 mile range. And if you think that just by doing so, whether it's even if it's New York City or San Francisco, I think that you open yourself up, especially in an industry that is pretty hyper specific and for very specific or niche roles, it becomes 
almost a liability to not have an openness to to remote candidates. But again, if you if you start your own company, if you're the CEO of the company, if you want to have an office, then that's that's on you. So whatever our clients tell us that they want to do, ultimately that's what we have to do. But I do think at least having an an option for remote employees is is really helpful. Well, in the recruiting space, it, it goes without saying it limits your candidate pool, right? I mean, and that's that's a choice I think you're referring mm-hmm. to. And if if you want only local candidates, well, then then that's the size of your pool. I'm personally hoping, and I don't know if you have a thought on this, that blockchain technology will evolve in such a way that it gives us access to the world as our candidate pool. You, you mentioned that a little bit earlier. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of restrictions on uh, you know, legal uh, restrictions when it comes to taxes and you know, country by country, what needs to be mm-hmm. done. But I don't know if, if that's too off topic, but have you thought about uh, how blockchain can enable that? Are you seeing that out there yet with companies working on that? Because I think it needs to happen. I'd love to see it happen. Yeah, there's there's some interesting things that I think happen with stable coins. And that's always been one of the big avenues in which this value propositions for for crypto as as a whole has been remittances and so i guess you know you can kind of say as a corollary of remittances you could even just say paying international employees or you know we in a lot of cases now take invoices for placement fees in stable coins so usdc kind of being one of the more prominent stable coins somebody doesn't have a bank account yet or whatever they can send usdc to us and and we'll take that happily um that said, I think there are, are some other companies doing cool work in that as well. I haven't actually worked with them specifically because we don't have any international police app proof talent, but uh, deal D E or D with two E's and then an L um, they have a like system where you can basically pay. It's kind of like a just works or a gusto, but for international employees. And I think they do a little bit with crypto there too. I'm not a hundred percent sure what they might do with it, but Kind of allows you to hire somebody in almost any country in the world and pay them easily, no matter where your headquarters is. So there's some outside of just blockchain tech. There's some cool things in that arena as well. Good, we need it. We need it. Um, well, but on that on that point, could you could you talk for a minute just again? I I know we're we're talking about a lot of different things that are more yeah. crypto and blockchain um, in in that area versus versus proof of talent in particular. But I think for your company, uh, hopefully you you'd agree that you're for your company to ultimately strive, adoption and familiarity really needs to continue to ramp. And, and we we both clearly think it will. Um, but I still think it's, you know, we're in the very early stage of, of just knowledge and awareness. So um, when you, what are some use cases that you see companies doing? Everyone kind of knows about Doge uh, for better or worse. <laughs> I'll say that, right? Um, usually I'm, I, I spend my, those conversations, you know, trying to uh, differentiate between mm-hmm. Doge and other cryptocurrencies in the space as a whole. But what what are some of the the practical use cases you see for blockchain that that companies are doing and, and that may um, you know interest employees who who want to gravitate towards that area? Yeah, there are, I think quite a few. Um, I think the biggest one still, if we're being honest, is speculation. It, like you said, you know, Doge is basically a you know, uh, an asset that is has value due to speculation and has pretty significant amount of value still to this day, which is pretty funny. Um, And you can make that argument across the industry and whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing, it happens. And I think in the traditional markets as well, but I think speculation is still for better, for worse, that is still one of the main use cases at this point in time. And I think that becomes maybe less and less over time, but still a huge use case. Um, That said, I think you have other avenues in which there is, is value. And I think the, Value prop of some of these things changes over time. For for Bitcoin in particular, it was the part of the reason it ran so crazy in in 2020, 2021 was this you know, treasury diversification asset, which you saw with Tesla, you saw with MicroStrategy, and just a different avenue to hold your wealth in outside of USD, kind of that digital gold. So I think you know, that's on the, the Bitcoin side of the house and people might have different views on on that. That said, outside of that, I think there's a lot of other things that are happening that are interesting with a, a variety of, of layer one blockchains out there, such as Ethereum, um, such as Solana, such as uh, even Polygon, which I guess is kind of a layer one or a layer two, but you have DeFi, which is decentralized finance, and there's different 
ways in which there's kind of a disintermediation of, of trading. So uh, exchanges such as Uniswap, which are kind of, I don't want to say democratizing exchanges, but it's it's a really interesting way utilizing smart contracts. NFTs are another thing um, that have become incredibly popular. And even over the last week or so, Reddit, which is obviously a huge website, they've started to integrate NFTs into their avatars. And that's just caught fire um, amongst their user base, which has been really interesting to see and how they've abstracted the it's, it's built on Polygon, which is kind of a, a layer two for Ethereum, kind of a faster, cheaper version of Ethereum in some in a very simple sense. And that's become very popular. And, and so that's been really interesting to see. You have things such as music NFTs, which are, which are really cool, kind of interesting to watch. There's one of the cool things I, I like about the crypto industry as a whole now versus, let's say, five years ago or longer, or even a few maybe three years ago, is that there's all these different subsectors to the industry where depending upon what interests you as an individual, like if you're if you're interested in traditional finance, there is there's DeFi. Um, if you are more of an, let's just say an artistic person, NFTs or specific NFTs might be really interesting to you. If you really like music, there are now these music NFTs and all these different ways of how basically these companies are trying to replace a Spotify or an Apple and how artists get paid. Uh, there's just all these different kind of subsets of the industry that were really, frankly, not available uh, four or five years ago. And it makes it so that you might like Bitcoin and that's great, but somebody else might not have any interest in what they would consider to be hard money and, and the, the, the principles and the properties be, behind Bitcoin. But if you're an artsy person and you like NFTs, hey, here's here's something for you. So there's sure. a lot of, of different avenues right now in the industry that I think is is cool just because it appeals to such a wider group of people than than it did a few years ago. There's so much. I mean, just 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 listening to what you just said and everything you mentioned is familiar to me. But a lot of people are you know, are hearing these things for the first time still. Where do you go? I mean, is there what resources would you recommend? I'd love to link you know, anything you 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 think would be a good idea. I know my sources, which um, I've I've gone to heavily over the years. But do you have anything like you know, kind of a one hundred and one uh, you know, resource to to get your feet wet? Yeah, it's it's a good question. <laughs> it's something I ask the people a lot too, just to hear what they what they say. Because quite frankly, there is a, an information overload within the industry, especially if it's something you're following on a day-to-day -day level. Uh, if you don't know where to look, it can it can definitely get overwhelming. Um, that said, for daily information, places like Coindesk, uh, The Block, and, and Blockworks are, you know, some of the, I would say, better like news sites if you're just trying to keep up with the, you know, the day-to-day. -day. Um, if you're looking for specific projects or prices, something like CoinGecko or, or Masari is really good. Uh, and there are countless podcasts out there in the space that talk. A lot of them have specific topics that they'll cover. So like Peter McCormick and What Bitcoin Did, very Bitcoin-focused podcast. That's great if that's something you're interested in. Uh, Bankless is another one that is much more Ethereum-focused and, and talking about the different technologies and use cases that are being built on Ethereum and involving Ethereum. So if you have specific types of, of, and of interests, then... There's probably a podcast or a YouTube channel out there for you. It's always good to to try and just check the sources though, because there's a lot of bad information out there. Quite frankly, there's some too, there's so. some wild stuff out there. That, that's there for sure. I, I'm personally a big fan of Lex Friedman's podcast. I don't mm. know if you listen to him at all, but uh, he he goes he, he you know, they're, they're long interviews, so he has the opportunity to go really deep. And I think that's really what caught my interest first was a couple of those podcasts with some really intelligent people who mm -hmm. um, did a great job of explaining you know, what's going on and what the future looks like and really why it's so necessary. Um, so those are some good resources. We'll link those for sure. Uh, let's talk about jobs since that's really what we're, we're here to do. Uh, otherwise I can keep asking <laughs> questions all day long uh, from an education standpoint. Uh, for, for folks who, who are interested in the space and, and aren't yet in it, um, what, what are some of the roles that are, that are just natural to move into, you know, I'm sure IT jobs, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, if there's anything beyond that, I'd love to know 
your thoughts on that too. But what are the some of the skills and background that um, are really just a natural path to get into um, the kind of jobs that you staff and recruit for? Yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a good question. And and to that point, like you said, IT. So software engineering is one of the biggest needs in the space. So if you are an engineer and you have interest in the crypto industry, you know, you're in luck because if you are a good engineer, you'll be able to really have have your pick of, of opportunities based upon what interests you. And I think there's hiring from an engineering standpoint across kind of all levels. And it's not just blockchain specific technology. So if you are just a you know, classically trained back end or full stack or front end dev or DevOps or site reliability engineer, kind of you name it, um, there are opportunities there. And then if you happen to be more into the weeds on some of the crypto stuff, kind of let's say a solidity engineer that's focused on Ethereum smart contracts, obviously, you know, you'll have some opportunities. That said, on the non-technical side, there is definitely quite a bit of hiring um, avenues in which you, know, you can find a role in that side of the house. So uh, product is is a big deal. A lot of product managers, product marketing managers, uh, marketing as a whole, operations, legal, compliance, sales and biz dev. The way I would somewhat think about it is if there is a role at either like a tech company or at a finance company, there's probably a logical transition to that within the crypto space, because in a lot of ways, crypto is kind of like a mashup between tech and finance. Some companies are more focused on the tech side. Some companies are more focused on the finance side, but if there's a job available at either a traditional tech company or a traditional finance company, there's probably the same job that's available within the crypto industry as well. Perfect. That's great. Now, how much experience do those companies generally look for in, in the space, mm -hmm. you know, specifically versus just being good, you know, in your area of expertise? So some companies require previous experience within the industry and, and or for specific roles, and some do not. Um, and, and it definitely is, is a role specific thing. Obviously there's only so many people that have experience within the crypto industry already, because we've only been around for, as an industry for so long. So for some roles, it does make sense where let's say you're a, a salesperson and this is a relatively new company and they want somebody to come in, step in and have a book of business that they know what's going on. Or alternatively for a you know, solidity engineer, they want somebody who's worked on smart contracts that are already live within the Ethereum space. And so those require crypto experience. That said, for example, you know, somebody might want a product manager, but they don't need any any specific crypto experience. They just want somebody who's a, you know, who's a really good product manager or they want a, a DevOps engineer. It doesn't need crypto experience, but they just want somebody who has you know really strong experience with Kubernetes and, and Docker um, and needs that. So it it depends upon on what skill set that they're hiring for. It's it's not, I guess it's it's not an exact split there in terms of how often one is the case over the other. The one thing I would say is that a lot of companies, what I usually see is that from like an overall experience professional experience level, a lot of organizations typically tend to look for somebody with at least like, let's say three years of experience professionally, huh. sometimes a little bit more, but especially for the smaller organizations, when you're talking about a small five or 10 person company, or even a little bit above that, many times they just don't have the infrastructure in place yet to train somebody who's very junior. So because of that, they are looking to hire somebody who has a smaller, or who has a quicker ramp up period who has a little bit more professional experience, who once they get in seat, they can somewhat hit the ground running without needing to be trained as a professional uh, in general. And so that tends to be less of the case as you go up market in the crypto space, as you start to talk about the coin bases of the world where they have the infrastructure and the training and all that type of, of process in place to bring on you know new grads or anybody like that. So, all right, you mentioned new grads. I happen to have a junior in college who is uh, is a computer science major. If you if you could go back, or if you were given advice mm -hmm. to someone that age now, what uh, what would you tell them to focus on based on where you think everything's going? So, I would say to do as well in school as you can, learn as much as you can in school, but also try and figure out what interests you in. If you are interested in the crypto space in general, I would try to figure out what is most interesting to you. And I would try to build up some experience outside of 
outside of the classroom. So I think this is the easiest transition and the easiest process for engineers versus other, like somebody in marketing or in sales. But the crypto industry as a whole is very much built on open source technology. So Bitcoin is open source technology. Ethereum is open source. There are all these projects in addition to Bitcoin and Ethereum that are open source technology in which if you you want to contribute, if you want to get involved, you can do so. Uh, You don't need to be employed by this company or anything like that. So because it's open source, if you are an engineer and you're quite frankly a good engineer, or even if you're not so good and you're just learning, you can get involved at a very early stage and build up a almost just your kind of like digital resume, digital footprint, whether it's GitHub or anywhere else. So I would say on, on that front, it's trying to pick those things that are interesting to you and try to just hack around as much as possible. Um, Whether that is just in your spare time, there's a bunch of different hackathons that are sponsored with like really good cash as well, which are probably a pretty good side hustle for somebody in in college who's looking to make a little bit of extra money as well. Well, But um, yeah, I would say to get involved as much as possible and find out what interests you because that might help you to skip that couple, let's say two or three years and this is this is kind of jumping off, but I, I this question, but I think one of the one of the interesting and, and great things about the crypto industry as a whole, and there's a lot of things I, I like about it, but I think that there are no matter who you are, if you're good at your job, if you're good at what you do in particular, most of the time, and I'll say most of the time, but most of the time the industry doesn't care like who you are, what your background is anything about that like you can be a high school student but if you're a good engineer there there are kids that are i've seen get hired at all some of these multi-billion dollar startups in the space that are 14 years old and they're just these like brilliant engineers and they don't care like this kid come in for the summer come work with us and i think that that is less of the case elsewhere um and in less of the case in other industries where even to to go further, there's a concept of uh, anonymity within the crypto space, and there are people that are don't have their public persona out there, and there are companies that are happy to hire somebody who is either fully anonymous or somewhat anonymous behind the scenes because they just respect the quality of work that they do versus more so. All right, I need this to person to fit this exact box, and I want them to have this background. It's like this person's good at their job. I don't care who they are. I don't care you know anything. Like I just want them here. So. Well, I mean, that that's, I really like you said that, and we just met today, but if it, it, hopefully we'll get to know each other better and you'll find that I, I'm someone who believes that college is not necessarily the way to go um, for, for a lot of people. It, you know, we were sort of, I was taught that growing up, my generation, I'm 51, it was sort of a given that you were supposed to go to college after high school, and that was a path to, you know, having a good career. But today, I think it's very different. I think technology has enabled that. And if you are willing to put in the work and you have the talent, as as you said, no no uh, no pun intended, then you you would you know you can succeed and you can thrive. And no one's going to hold you back, right? No one's going to care yep. what your degree is or where you went to school if you can outperform someone else and uh, and deliver. So I, I'm really glad you brought that up because I think young people in particular, and and that's who a lot of our audience. Uh, we're trying to get the word out to it, it was in gig is, Hey, you don't have to follow a traditional path. You don't have to, um, you know, to do you know, your parents, what your parents or na- friends and neighbors or, or you know, and family are telling you to do, you can chart your own course. And and it sounds like that's what you're, you're suggesting as well. Yeah. I think the, the industry as a whole is, is so young. And I think that there are a lot of appealing aspects about the industry to many people. And I think that's even one of the things that is so cool about recruiting in the space is, and I haven't recruited in my first job out of college was as a recruiter. Uh, and it's been 10 years since I, I worked at that job. And there wasn't a whole lot of, of passion in that. Per- it was just general IT staffing. And th- not that there's anything wrong with that, but there wasn't a whole lot of passion behind you know, talking to people and, and the individuals doing what they were doing. They were just kind of showing up there, collecting a paycheck. And granted, that's that, that's life for a lot of people. That's not a bad thing. However, there are people that 
like love the crypto industry and it's almost like an intoxicating space to be in. It moves so quick. There's so many things that happen for better, for worse. There's a lot of opportunity within the space. It's fast moving. It is still in many cases brand new and the things we're building are, are very novel and new. And because of that, people are like genuinely excited. And sure. I think that there's not, not to say that is not true in any industry out there, but I think it's probably one of the few where people really get up and are are jacked up to be a part of of the space. And I think that that is is really an enjoyable aspect of things. And and you like every day just talking to, to to candidates and talking to clients in the space, like you you see it and and you feel it even when you know, things are down seventy percent from, from all time highs or anything like that, people are still excited and they're ready to go and they want to work in the space. And, and, and that is, that's exciting and inspiring to see. Yeah. I can't articulate why. And I will tell you, my wife doesn't necessarily share the sentiment when, when I talk to her about where uh, our investments are in the, in the crypto space right now, but it doesn't bother me in the slightest. It, 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 yeah, I wish of course that the, the prices were up, but it, I have no bad feeling over it. I have no concern over it because my conviction is so strong. And I and you feel that energy for people who are involved in the space. So to get to recruit for that every day, I, I can I have to imagine that um, it, it's exactly as you described. You get up excited because everyone is going to do something new and and to break new ground, which is hard to come by with a lot of jobs, as you know from your your past in recruiting. Uh, if someone wants to to explore the space, where, where do they start? How do they contact your team? What what's kind of the first step in um, in finding out what kind of jobs are out there and where that where they fit into into all of this? Yeah, absolutely. So, if they want to contact our team, our, our website proofoftalent.co, uh, we have a submit your resume form, and you can feel free to reach out to us there. You know, any point in time, I have a seven, soon be eight recruiters on our team. So happy to reach out. Um, that said, outside of just like generally you know, that side of the house, I think one of the things that you really want to do if you're interested in the industry is trying to figure out the path to get into the space and what skill set you have currently that matches up with an opportunity within the industry. And so a lot of times the advice that I will provide to people that are interested in the space is trying to build up a complementary skill set outside of the industry because some people will come to you know, come to me or they'll reach out and they'll say, Hey, I really want to get a job in crypto, but I'm not good at anything. That's a tough sell to a company. If right. if you are if you don't have any value to add to an organization, it's a it's a tough sell. You need to be good at something. So figure out what it is. And and for a lot of people, it's it's somewhat of an easy process. You might be in sales, you might be in marketing, you might be an engineer. Um what path is there for you to get into the industry from that point in time? And so because of that, I would say just trying to figure out that that journey for you and doing two things with that. So A, just building up that complementary skill set to be as strong as you possibly can. Uh, so just being the best salesperson, being the best marketer, being the best engineer that you can be outside of the crypto industry. And then in addition to that, I would try to build up your crypto specific knowledge base as much as you can. And you don't have to be an expert because quite frankly, nobody is really an expert. That said, I think you want to have something in particular that you like talking about that you find fascinating because in an interview, many times what will happen is that somebody will talk about an opportunity. They will, um, they'll basically, you'll have an interviewer who will ask a, a, an interviewee, Hey, what about the crypto space is interesting to you? And somebody might say, Oh, well, I've invested in a coin or two. And I think that that is, is cool. That's not a great answer. If somebody asks you, Hey, what do you find about in interesting in the space? You want to have a specific topic that you actually like and can talk about. And you can talk about that for five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And you can have a little bit of back and forth and you can just show that you've done your 60 minutes, couple hours of research and that you are well-versed in this subject. So I would say those are really just the two things is trying to A, build up that complementary skill set when you can and where you can. Um, and then B, trying to supplement that with some crypto specific knowledge. And again, you don't have to be an expert, just enough to be dangerous, really. 
And I'm glad you clarified that. And 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 so I'll go back and and say, you know, make no mistake, Rob, Rob, and and the and the his team at Proof of Talent are not there to find jobs for anyone who wants to get into the crypto space. It's actually the opposite, right? You find people for jobs. I think one of the things to um and why I was asking you about what kind of background is is required, how much crypto or blockchain specific experience is needed, is because uh you know people need to know how to be found. People need to know, um, you know, where to apply. And, and, you know, do you list your jobs on, on your website? Uh, we do not. So we post them on social, but we do not always list the full, uh, full jobs that we have on the website. So, so how can someone be found if, if they, if they are inclined, you know, what, mm -hmm. you know, what kind of, or do they, is it really just someone, you know, who has, you know, it has that technical experience, has that knowledge, what would you, how do they close that gap between not yet having experience and, and making themselves available as a, as a prospective candidate? So I would say LinkedIn is, is always a good spot still to this day. Um, I would just indicate some, some level of, of crypto interest. I think those keywords are always helpful. So if you have any blockchain or crypto related interest, having just, you know, a, a sentence or two in your, in your personal bio saying, Hey, this is something that I'm interested in and I'm passionate about. Uh, and I think that'll help in terms of just overall discoverability or in your resume as well. I think that's always good. Um, there are a number of, of crypto specific job boards. If you're trying to, to browse those as well. Um, I, I think crypto jobs list, pump crypto jobs. Uh, there are a couple off the top of my head. There's, there's probably more than a couple at this point in time, but there's, there's a good number of, of crypto specific job boards. And I would say if you're on the technical side of the house, um, having a GitHub that has contributions to projects within the space is hugely helpful and, and proves a ton of, of, of interest. And then I would say, in addition to that, a lot of the conversation in crypto happens on Twitter. So if you are somebody that has a, there are a lot of pe people that have been hired basically on their Twitter accounts and their contributions to Twitter. And so if you are comfortable with that, if you have some interest there, I would say to to get on Twitter to start interacting with people because uh, it is definitely a good place to to network as as much as you can. So it's a pretty small community still. It it is. I, I and I think that that is one of the elements that is again like going back to the industry being appealing. It is a small community, and I think the access is still really there. And and what I mean by that is if you are a 22, 23 year old, and you want to talk to the CEO of JP Morgan or, uh, or Goldman, or you want to talk to, uh, you know, Tim at Apple or, you know, the CEO of, of Google or, you know, what have you, those are probably conversations that you'll never have an opportunity to have. Right. Um, it's just not going to happen for the most part. That said, the access that you have on in the crypto space, there are CEOs of, multi multi billion dollar crypto exchanges and these companies that are interacting with people on Twitter that are you know responding to DMs that are they're just so much more publicly available and that is i think that it's great just in terms of of access and, and having kind of that ability as as a whole but i think it also kind of speaks volumes to to where just like the where the industry is and especially once you get into the industry too i think it's always surprising to the people that work in the industry for the first time when you're on a biz dev call with a company and you're talking to you know this famous multi-billionaire within the industry or something along those lines where that might not have happened until you were you know much much older and much much more experienced in a traditional industry i love it i, I think that's great and i'm glad you, you made that point because that is hard to obtain in in most almost every other industry, at least it, it come to mind. So um, it, it the opportunity to advance rapidly to to jump ahead is rare, and yeah, you should take advantage of that. What about on the client side, Rob? If, if um, are you guys open to to new clients right now, and or you know, how does yeah. a company know whether they'd be a good fit for proof of talent? Yeah, uh, so we are, and if a company so say 90 plus percent of our hiring is US based or US time zone based. Uh, we're probably not as good of a fit for a company that's building out an international workforce at this point in time. We do a little bit of hiring in in you know, Europe and, and in Asia, but for the most part, we're US based. So I would say you know, that is one area in which you know we're 
from just from a, a client standpoint, I, I usually kind of preface that. Um, that said, typically we come in and start working with companies a little bit beyond the founding team. So sometimes when somebody will reach out to us with an idea uh, and maybe you know, one or two people on the team and say, hey, we're, we're hiring for a founding engineer. A lot of times that's not the best fit because a little bit too early on, maybe that company isn't raised yet, but let's say a company's raised a seed round and they have five people on the team and maybe they have uh, the, the the bones of a product in place. That's when we can start to have a conversation and, and, and then beyond that. So usually seed series A, series B type companies are uh, that are U S based or, or hiring within the U S we've done a lot of work with international teams, building out a U.S. office or building out a U.S. team. So I would say that those are kind of the sweet spots for us. And we work with anybody that's involved within the crypto space. So it could be a company building blockchain infrastructure. It could be somebody trading the asset. It could be an exchange, uh, kind of you name it, as long as it is a company that has some element of, of involvement within the industry, that's that's kind of where we come into play. Perfect. Awesome. So candidates, you have your answer. Clients, prospective clients, you have your answer and you know how to find proof of talent. And you know, I'm just really excited to see what what happens with 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 you guys. I'm 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 always excited when I see someone doing something new and innovative and you've, you've jumped on this and, and that's, that's, uh, that's easier said than done. I have to ask, what was the catalyst if there was a, 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 you know, for you deciding, Hey, this is, this is my time because I, I you know, looking at your resume, you said you started in recruiting, uh, you, you work for some big organizations and you had to take this leap. What was, was there a single catalyst that, uh, that caused that? Yeah. So I started in recruiting and then I worked in software sales for a few years at, uh, NetSuite slash Oracle and, and LinkedIn. And 2017, early 2018, I really wanted to work in the crypto space. So I left my job at Oracle and worked at a startup called AirSwap, um, which had just raised a bunch of money. And it was first time I'd ever worked at a true like tech startup. It was really, really interesting, super fun, uh, pretty illuminating in terms of like how that process works and and a lot of things around like the, the tech startup world. Um, that said, kind of towards the tail end of my time there, I was uh, maybe approaching like 29 years old. And I you know, worked at small companies. I worked at big companies. And I kind of always felt that after a year and a half to two years, for whatever reason, I was just getting bored <laughs> for, for lack of a better word. And I wanted to, I've always had an entrepreneurial spirit and I've always wanted to do something and start my own company, but it's never really had the idea or bandwidth to do it. And had the idea kind of really randomly one day um, just driving the car. I was like, Hey, I don't really think that there's a, a, a super well-known recruiting company in the crypto space. And there were one or two at the time. Um, but I don't think anybody really based in the United States. And so I talked to a couple of different people and ended up just thinking, all right, this idea actually has some legs. So I, I left my role, um, at AirSwap. And for the first like six months, I just worked on the company by myself and, ended up making a few placements within the industry and made enough money to, to hire my first employee that worked with me. And then it's kind of snowballed ever since. And now we're 11 people. So it's, it's been a, been a fun ride. Awesome. Good for, good for you. Well, I, I remember the day when I decided to quit my job to start four corner resources, my wife was pregnant with our third child and uh, <laughs> we were in a grocery store parking lot. And I said, I think I'm going to do this. And she's like, well, just don't be stressed when the baby comes. I'm like, <laughs> really that that is not an option and so I, I have a lot of respect for anyone who can do that it, it i know it's you know the world is not necessarily supportive of of that it's it's much easier said than done and you did it at a time when you know there was a lot of um, challenges with, with covid hitting right after and you're on the other side of that and the future is really bright man i i, I um I think uh you know things are going to are going to go go great based on everything i've seen about your company what you're doing and talking to you today only solidifies that. So congratulations on, on your success so far and best wishes Appreciate for it. a great future. Thank you. Awesome. Well, Rob, thanks again for today. And we look forward, I'll follow up with you, uh, you know, as time goes on and we'll, 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 we'll talk about the next evolution of blockchain, uh, you know, a year from now. Is that, a, is that, is that a deal? Sounds okay. good to me. Awesome. All right, man. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot.